Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wild Things. My name is Nina Hill. I'm a science fellow with the Nature Conservancy, and I'm so excited to share with you about our Chicago Biodiversity Assessment Project. And here today with me is my friend, Matt. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Mulligan. I'm the Urban Biodiversity Program Manager with the Nature Conservancy here in Chicago. And Nina and I are both going to be talking with you about this new project that we're really excited to start that uses this uh, online app uh, called iNaturalist that allows you to add different uh, wildlife and plant life uh, sightings and then that adds it uh, to this really great uh, data source of different sightings all throughout the world. Uh, and the reason we're talking about biodiversity today is you know it really relates to all of our lives uh, because as, as all of you know you know we face a lot of ecological challenges uh, both in urban areas and even in rural areas where you know, there's a changing environment in terms of climate change and also the impacts that we have on the environment. And that can lead to negative uh, interactions like poor air quality, high heat, increased flood risks, or your basement flooding more often. Uh, but the good news is that biodiversity can help with all that. Having extra plant and animal species in the area, they can kind of mitigate some of these negative effects and they can protect us from some of these, uh, you know, changes in the world that might be negative. And not only that, you can be an active participant in this process. You can help us and other scientists learn more about plant and animal species in cities all across the world just by using your phone, because we all need your help in order to, to really understand this process. So with the Chicago Biodiversity Assessment, we're just kind of kicking off this project. And right now we have some pretty basic goals. The first is we want to know whether or not we can use iNaturalist to figure out what patterns of biodiversity are all throughout the city of Chicago. Can we use this tool to really adequately know where these different species are present on this landscape? And not only that, can we use existing data? So like existing land cover data, information that we already have uh, along with these observations to determine what types of elements on the landscape are important in determining the presence of different plant and animal species. And that's something that we think we can do based on past studies that have been done. And then finally, we wanna look at the human component. We want to know whether or not there are barriers to participation using iNaturalist. So are there reasons that we're not seeing a lot of observations in certain parts of the city? And if so, how can we remove those barriers? How can we work with different communities and how can those communities teach us a bit more about their neighborhoods? So with this information, you know, there's a lot of ecological challenges out there that we need to solve. And the main problem is we don't have a lot of information on biodiversity, especially in city environments. And that's a huge handicap when we're trying to look and see what kind of surfaces these plants and animal species can provide. Um, so that lack of information is a real big hurdle that we need to go over. Uh, the other bit of information that you know biodiversity can provide is really just showing how valuable some of these different plots of land are in a city environment. So you have a lot of land managers and a lot of public officials that make decisions about the landscape. They shape the landscape for all of us. And they're doing that based on existing information that's available. But if we're able to provide information that gives a valuation of you know where areas are biodiverse and which ones aren't, that could influence where industrial complexes are put, where parks are added. So it could have a huge impact on all of us. And the way that we're trying to gather this information through iNaturalist, this can also provide an increase in terms of public engagement. So everyone's engagement and awareness of environmental issues around them just using this tool. And as we discussed before, you know, there's a you know, great impact on each and every one of us based on biodiversity. Biodiversity can, you know, really help in terms of, you know, preventing your basement from being flooded all that more often just by having more plant species, uh, different plant species nearby to kind of, uh, you know, intercept some of that flood water. So it's not, you know, pouring down the street like you might see in some neighborhoods. Uh, it's also, you know, picking up all those negative chemicals that are coming off of the highway. You know, so there's a lot of, you know, uh, factors that uh, biodiversity can really uh, be positive in, in preventing. And uh, this map on the right, this is our Chicago green print tool. This is a GIS tool that is showing different neighborhoods that are particularly vulnerable to negative effects that we've talked about, like poor air quality, high heat, increased flood risk. 
So that way we can identify these are neighborhoods of the greatest need. So if we're able to get biodiversity information uh, using iNaturalist, we can get this virtual community together that's empowered uh, that can really show, okay, well, there's, here's where all these different species are. Is there an association with all these plant and, species, plant and animal species and these negative effects that are brought on by climate change? Do we see that, that association? And if so, uh, is it positive or negative? And how can we use those um, natural solutions to our advantage? And then finally, you know, it could really provide some outcomes that could have positive impacts on our lives. Uh, so with iNaturalist information, you're gathering information on private land. That's not something that's normally done with scientific studies. So you're really expanding the scope of what we can look at in terms of the plant animal species that we see. Uh, and not only that, you're putting a spotlight on those areas and we're showing the ecological value of these areas that were normally thought of as, as low quality. So different neighborhoods could be shown as very important for certain species. And that could lead to investment in underserved neighborhoods or underrepresented areas, which could lead to positive impacts on public health. It could lead to natural infrastructure solutions. And it could also lead to more community engagement programs from different organizations throughout the area. So there's a lot of positive benefits that could go with learning more about the natural world around us. And one thing we want you to remember is that nature is everywhere. It's not just in the traditional green spaces like forest preserves, city parks, but it's in your backyard. It could be uh, off of your balcony. It could be in vacant lots or even down alleyways. I mean, it, it can be anywhere, just growing in a crack in the street. And I think that's more of a challenge is to be able to find these different plant and animal species in unconventional areas. It's easy to find them in these like big forest preserves, but if you can find them in areas that you normally wouldn't find these species, it makes it all that much more rewarding. So what we're you know, asking is to see if every one of you could become a community scientist. Can you, you know, really contribute to our scientific study as well as many other scientific studies in the area that are using information like iNaturalist to have a better understanding of the natural world? And it really requires little to no knowledge going in. You do not have to be an ornithologist that knows everything about birds. Uh, you can go in knowing absolutely nothing about nature and that's okay because it has this really interactive uh, online community that is very supportive and teaches everyone a lot about this tool and about how they can you know, learn little tips and tricks about how to identify different uh, plants and animals, which is really great. And it allows also for you to teach us about your neighborhood, for you to teach us about the natural world as well. And if you've never used iNaturalist, this is a real quick uh, overview of how it works. Um, so this is just a screenshot of my phone. Uh, this is an observation I had last week walking my dog around the block. Uh, I saw a small mammal walking down the sidewalk and naturally I took a picture of it. And the great thing about iNaturalist is when you take a picture of an animal uh, or plant on your phone, it gives you different suggestions of what species you're looking at. So you can see that there's a picture, it looks like a tiny little brown speck, I think for most people. But if you look down, uh, that self-identification feature gives you a list of different species that it thinks it is based on the image. And that's only based on the image. So based on uh, you know, where you are, you can kind of narrow down what you're seeing. We don't see hedgehogs in this area or you shouldn't see hedgehogs in this area. Uh, so really the only logical solution on this is a meadow vole. And I can tell you that's actually what that species was. To be fair, I'm a mammologist and I did small mammal studies. So that's why I know that, but uh, you're able to select it. If you didn't know that, that's also okay. You can say unknown or I have no idea and the community will help you identify it. But then the next bit of information you can add is different notes. So you can you know, add different observations that you made of that species that might not show up in that picture that can be really helpful. Uh, it adds the uh, date uh, based on the photo stamp from when you took the picture. And then you can also add the location um, just by showing um, you know, the GPS uh, button on your phone. It can add right where you're standing. Uh, and that also helps in terms of where these different species are distributed. And then once you're done, you upload it and it starts off as casual grade, but if you are able to identify it down to the species and someone else confirms what you saw, then it gets bumped up to research grade. And that means that when you're downloading all this data online, then uh, it can be, it's at a higher level essentially of certification and it can be you know, incorporated into different scientific studies, which is really neat. So you can see your observation as part of a larger study, uh, which will help all kinds of different people. 
but if you're a parent and you know you don't necessarily want them to use iNaturalist, and there's reasons why you know kids don't use iNaturalist, it's because of location. Uh, you know, with kids, you know, you don't want people to necessarily know where everybody is. Uh, but the iNaturalist team has thought of that, and they created Seek, and it's basically a kid-friendly version of iNaturalist that allows kids to use all the great tools that are part of iNaturalist, but it doesn't deal with, um, you know, sh constantly showing where you are in terms of your location. And it also has fun little bits that are added into it that include badges or different levels and things like that. So they can essentially kind of progress up uh, throughout, uh, you know, using this tool throughout their time. Uh, it also has a great identification feature as you're taking the picture, it identifies the species as you're taking the picture. So that's really cool. Um, so that's one way to interact with your family and kind of move up uh, to the next level. So you can graduate onto the iNaturalist tool from the SEEK tool. And then, uh, so I talked with you a little bit about how you use the iNaturalist tool on your phone. Dita, uh, Nina's gonna talk to you a little bit more about uh, what you do with the data after it's been uploaded into the system. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, it's great. Anybody can use iNaturalist on their mobile device through either the iNaturalist app or the Seek app. All of those data go behind the scenes to a centralized database. And this is what it looks like. You can interact with it on the web using your computer. Um, so this is the iNaturalist website and you can go and access all of your observations there. And you can access observations from across the world. Um, I think this is so cool. Um, you know, I can look at things from so far away and this community is very deep. It is very helpful and there's a lot of information, a lot of, um, forums and posts and stuff that you can click around and learn a lot of new things. One thing I do want to draw your attention to here is under the community tab, you can see that there's something called projects. So projects are a group um, that is created of iNaturalist users who contribute observations to a particular taxonomic group or around a particular location. For example, uh, you might be particularly interested in learning about mushrooms. There's a group for that. You can join the Microflora of Chicago Region Project. Or say you're interested in a particular location, um, like Chicago, for example. Uh, coming up this spring, you can join the City Nature Challenge. Uh, so see how many observations we can get and see how that might compare to, say, Boston or Dallas. So this is a pretty cool project. And I think there's some other folks here at Wild Things who will be talking more about that. So to take a look at the data set that we have in hand, we're looking at iNaturalist research grade observations for Cook County from 2008 to 2020. So here's kind of a first look at what these data look like. Um, you can see that I mapped them here and each color represents a species that belongs to a certain taxonomic class or group. So for example, the yellow dots are birds, Pink ones or purple color ones are insects and the green triangles represent plants. So on this first look, we can already start to see that some of these observations are clustered together and some of them are more dispersed or spread out. So the aim of our project for the Chicago Biodiversity Assessment is to try to understand how uh, these patterns are distributed across the landscape and then to try and understand why these patterns are the way they are. So if we take a look at additional information uh, here in this map, we show land cover polygons or land use polygons in different colors. And this information stands out right away. We can see that these uh, points that are clustered together in the center are all located at a city park. And that makes sense. We know it's easy to think about nature as being over at the park, but as Matt pointed out, nature is everywhere. Nature is in the blue and the red and the orange polygons, and we want to know how it, biodiversity is across the entire area. Nature is at the bus stop, it's in your yard, it's at the school or beside the church parking lot, and we need your help to continue adding observations. Every data point that goes into this set is information that helps us learn about biodiversity and helps us inform our conservation planning. So 
I love looking at spatial data on a map, but here's another way we look at it to try and see if we can find patterns. So these data are aggregated or grouped into their land use cover types. And you can see on the far side of the plot that open space, which is parks and preserves and conservation lands, definitely account for a lot of the observations in our data set. But on the other side of the plot is where tools like iNaturalist and community scientists like you give real power to our project. If we had to do this research, it would take a long time and be really difficult to get researchers in and collect data in all these places. We just wouldn't be able to do it. So we hope that you can help us and continue observing nature in residential communities, along the roadside, in commercial lands, free work, everywhere and at every time. On this slide, you can see I've grouped observations by month and year. So as years increase along the x-axis along the bottom, you can see we have a huge increase in, uh, in the number of observations that have been added to the data set. So in total, between 2008 and 2020, we have just under 94,000 observations. And in 2020, so last year alone, we had 26% of those data added. So that's a lot. And this data set continues to grow, which is great. In total, we have 4,161 species, and 623 of those were new last year. We have just under 3,500 observers, and nearly half of those were new last year. So this is great and um, is a lot of useful information uh, that we can continue to learn more about biodiversity. So as I said, we can learn about nature at all times of the year. Um, in this plot, again, the, the data are grouped by month and by class. So you can see that those red and orange kind of represents those summer months, times that we might be out walking the trails or visiting the parks, times that we think most about visiting nature. Um, and while we, it's true, we'd expect to see more insects and flowers during the summer, we can definitely get out and see nature at any time of the year. In some species, we can only observe outside of summertime. Um, birds, many mammals and fungi species. Ones like these, my favorite fall bloomers, which are gentians. These are um, flowers, they're so beautiful, real low to the ground, and they only bloom in late September, October, and sometimes in November. So you have to be out there to see them. Another species that you might not see is Harris's sparrow. There are wintering species here in our Chicago region. And so 100% of our observations are October through December of these really cute birds. And the same is the case with other migratory species that might only be passing through our region in the spring or, or the fall. So taking a step back, what does Cook County look like with all of the, the iNaturalist observations? Well, I've grouped them here in a map in what's called a, a heat map. So each of these little data clusters and the intensity of the color represents the number of observations that are clustered together very near each other. So I have them separated by animals and plants. Um, and you can see there are definite clusters across the landscape. And so many of these, we want to start asking, why are they clustered in this way? Some of our most common plant animal species are listed here on the right. Our usual suspects of monarch, uh, gray squirrels, mallard, robin, uh, and beautiful common milkweed. Uh, bird's foot trefoil, mayapple, prairie trillium, though, is an awesome one. So I ask you, do you know what these species are? Have you seen them? You can certainly get on iNaturalist and find out. So what influences those clusters on the map? There are many different things. Um, they can be roads, transportation corridors, utility corridors, where the lakes and rivers are on the landscape. Um, these are all environmental characteristics or built infrastructure. But we want to also dig in to what influences not just the biodiversity and how that's scattered across the landscape, but also what influences the people who are there to interact and to record the biodiversity in iNaturalist app. So we want to also look at variables 
of socioeconomic data, uh, such as population density or um, uh, household income uh, within a certain area. So there's a lot that we're going to dig into, and I'm really excited to, uh, you know, move forward with this project and continue learning uh, to inform our conservation planning. So what might we be able to learn from this? Uh, not only are we mapping the spatial biodiversity, but in learning why it has different patterns. Here's an example of one way we might apply these uh, information. So we know a lot about monarchs and we know that they really rely on milkweed as a food source. So I put together a couple of maps just to see where are we seeing monarchs and where are we seeing milkweed on the landscape. On one side, there, there are observations from the Chicago Botanical Garden, a protected conservation area. And as of course we would expect, they have some beautiful uh, milkweed plants there. But what about outside of protected areas? in this neighborhood near Oak Park. There are quite a few observations of monarchs and milkweeds. And honestly, when we see these orange dots that represent monarchs, some of them aren't by milkweed observations. So those might be opportunities that we can put a community garden on the ground or, um, or a rain garden. These might be opportunities for uh, conservation works. Yeah, thanks, Nina. And, you know, really thinking about that, you know, relationship between monarch butterflies and milkweed, it's a perfect example of really, you know, some of the connections that this data set might be able to tease out. That is a connection that we've known about for quite some time with uh, some of our traditional research methods, you know, going out and, uh, and that's why we go out and plant a lot of milkweed uh, species in the Chicago area, which is great. But there could be a lot of, you know, uh, unknown relationships that are out there that we're hoping that this data set could inform us about. So knowing how some of these different um, you know, landscape burials, some of these different plant and animal species interact with one another and if they are dependent in order to uh, predict them in our environment, which is really exciting. And this is also something where we're hoping that uh, you know, this information could inform us uh, about where we can intervene with natural solutions as well. So whether we can um, add uh, uh, different natural infrastructure solutions as well um, and making sure that we have uh, equitable access to green space. So there's a lot of ways that we can use this information to help inform uh, land decisions and policy. Uh, but as you're as we're talking about this, obviously you all um, or most of you probably aren't able to uh, influence land policy just on your own. But there's a lot of really great ways to uh, get connected with the natural world that maybe doesn't really rely on iNaturalist in general. Uh, so a couple of different examples to give you an idea of other opportunities out there uh, include the Volunteer Stewardship Network. Uh, it's this great statewide program with the Nature Conservancy where you can uh, join as a, a volunteer steward and you can kind of lead uh, with all kinds of different work at different sites. And it also allows you to get in touch with a lot of different training opportunities, workshops, and uh, social events that you can be a part of. And it is this really great uh, smaller community, people who really like to be outdoors and, and working in natural areas. Uh, there's also the Chicago Park District Community Stewardship Program, which is kind of similar to the Volunteer Stewardship Network, but focused on Chicago parks themselves. So if you're a, a local uh, Chicagoan and you wanna you know, really take an active role in working on a specific park near you, you can actually become a stewardship leader at that park. So you can take a leadership role in terms of how that area is maintained and, uh, and upkept. So that's really kind of a cool way to, to get involved. And then finally, uh, our, you know, one of our colleagues over at the Chicago Botanic Garden, they have a project that's called Project Budverse, which is also a really cool app, um, but that's focused on plant species exclusively. And it's looking at the timing of when different plants, uh, you know, bud and flower or their leaves emerge. And you can look at uh, how that is changing in terms of the timing of when these different buds uh, open up uh, over time. And that's another way of looking at the impacts of climate change uh, from one year to the next. So that's a really cool way to kind of link climate change with uh, community science. And then there's also the uh, Chicago Wilderness iNaturalist project. And that's uh, something that uh, is being worked on with the Field Museum. They're going to be uh, analyzing the larger Chicago wilderness region looking at iNaturalist data. And 
uh, they have a project that's set up that anyone can join. You can go to the web page and you can see where people are doing different observations all throughout the Chicago wilderness region. So within the, the you know, multi-state area, which is kind of cool to see what species are present in this larger region. So some of the key takeaways that we wanted to, uh, you know, just really share with you as we're reflecting on uh, the Chicago biodiversity assessment as we're kind of kicking this off. Uh, the first thing is just that, you know, biodiversity has a positive influence on all of us and that it is not always in these traditional green spaces, in these forest preserves, in these parks, in these areas that you normally associate with, um, with different wildlife and plant life, they can be anywhere. And we should always be looking because there could be different landscape elements that we're not thinking about that could help predict the presence of these different species and help us to really understand what they need in order to thrive in a human dominated landscape. And tools like iNaturalist, they're a great way for everyone to interact with the natural world, but also to help us, you know, instead of having a handful of scientists going out and trying to collect information, we have an entire army of people that are going out and already enjoying nature. So you're able to cover so much more ground and be able to really observe things that, you know, a couple people could not do. So it's really filling in this niche and this need and also providing some great information and can do, and can do a lot of good along the way. And then finally, you know, you're helping all of us learn more information about your neighborhood. You're providing us information about where you live. And that is extremely valuable. And that could in turn lead to positive impacts in different neighborhoods across the city, which is what we want to see. So with that, you know, Nina and I would just like to thank you uh, for, you know, taking the time to, uh, to, you know, listen to our presentation. Uh, we have our email addresses at the bottom. So if you have any questions, we would love to answer them. You know, just looking forward to answering any questions that you have. Nina, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add. Thanks. I'm, I'm excited to hear your ideas and suggestions. Um, yeah, and keep adding those observations. We'll see you online. Absolutely. We want feedback. So if anyone has any ideas to help with this project, if you want to be involved and take a leadership role in this, uh, we'd love to hear it. So thank you all and uh, have a great rest of your conference. So originally, um, Nina and Matt's um, session was scheduled to be one of our streaming on demand sessions, um, but we are absolutely thrilled to have the opportunity to invite them um, onto the Wild Things main stage right now. Um, so Nina and Matt, if you want to turn on your mics, turn on your cameras um, to be here to continue to answer questions live. Well, thank you, Brandon. Um, so. You know, we'd be, uh, Nina and I are really happy to be able to answer any questions that you all may have. Uh, we wrote down a couple and we were trying to quickly answer them as we were going. I'm sure we missed a few. Uh, Nina and I are really happy to be able to answer any oh, questions. Uh, Nina, have. if you have another uh, time, we might have to close it. We answer them as we were going. I'm sure we missed a few. Uh, Nina and I are Uh, sorry about that, everyone. We're facing a little bit of technical difficulties here. Um, so I'll just start to answer some of the questions that you may have. And I think Nina got uh, kicked off here for a second, so she'll be jumping in. Uh, but I know a lot of you had questions related to uh, just the general use of iNaturalist and you know what we're looking for uh, in terms of observations. And you know, really, uh, with iNaturalist, the, the great benefit is that you're able to get observations really anywhere. Uh, you're not you know, stuck to public land. So you're not stuck to um, you know, just the traditional areas, the traditional green spaces, the parks, uh, areas where you can get permission to gather data. Uh, it really is, is, is limitless to where anyone can um, you know, safely access an area and take a picture with their phone. Uh, so that's why we're you know, really interested in just getting any and all observations. So it doesn't matter if it's you know, species of, you know, particular concern, whether they're threatened or endangered, um, or if they're even native or non-native, we, you know, would value information from all species and observations that are seen. So even if it is a rat in an alley or a feral cat, that information is really helpful because obviously these uh, non-native species have interactions with native species of concern and knowing the presence on the landscape and what uh, landscape features might help predict uh, the presence of these species uh, is helpful to all 
other plant and animal species on the landscape. Uh, so uh, I know that that was a couple of questions was uh, whether or not, uh, you know, including some of these common species are important for this study and for our naturalists. And, and I, would, I, I would say a resounding yes, we want all observations for this. Um, the other questions uh, I know that we sort of answered as we were going through uh, related more to, uh, you know, sensitivity with some of this information. So you are, you know, providing observations uh, sometimes with threatened or endangered species, some of which are plants that obviously can't move and uh, could be, you know, targeted if people were wanting to go through and, and remove them from the landscape. Uh, so. Uh, fortunately, Cassie Sari is on this call too, and she is an iNaturalist like expert, I would say. <laughs> uh, and you know, I know she answers some of those questions, but there are a lot of settings that are in place that obscures the location of those observations when it's a sensitive species. So it essentially keeps it in the general region, but it moves it to a random location, so you can't pinpoint where it is. So it makes it it'd make it very, very difficult for anyone to go out and, and search for a particular species. But if it's something that is of extreme concern, you can also choose not to have it uh, included in the wider data set if there are um, you know, serious concerns of, uh, of someone removing them from, from the collection. Yeah. Um, so I know that that was probably about like a dozen questions with those two answers right there. So hopefully I, I kind of uh, hit a few of those. Uh, Nina, welcome back. Um, is, is there any um, like questions that you wanted to answer? I just basically talked about uh, you know the value of identifying all plant and animal species, whether they're native or non-native, and then talking about a little bit about the location uh, concern that some folks had. Uh, were there any other uh, questions that stood out that you wanted to address right now? Well, I just wanted to note about the some of the sensitive and rare species. Um, you know, it is unfortunate that. Uh, people find ways to extract information. Um, I know that there are some good conversation um, in the chat about that. And I think that's a conversation worth continuing to have um, and think about it if you're on a particular site. But I just wanted to reiterate, like not to share like this rare orchid species. I know I'd be super excited to find it and would want to document it and, and tell everybody about it. But that's something that I would refrain from putting on Facebook or other social media um, for that exact reason. I wouldn't want somebody to uh, go and target that um, that location. But yeah, that's that's a really good point. And I'm kind of seeing a question that was a little bit later here um, that was talking about areas that were uh, reconstructed or restored. So areas where maybe plant life normally wasn't at a specific location in the past, but are they're adding like, you know, a lot of native planting. So maybe like introducing tall grass prairies. Uh, I would not consider that to be cultivated. So uh, I think with iNaturalist, and again, you know, whenever you're giving these like broad labels, there's a lot of gray area for interpretation. Uh, but I would personally say that, you know, that is native habitat. So that is like, you know, native species that are in an area where it normally would be. So I would still consider that not to be cultivated. Yes, it wasn't traditionally there, it wasn't historically there. But when they're talking about cultivated or uh, uh, you know or ornamental plants, that's just saying like you're bringing like uh, you know some of these like flowering plants from like Japan or something and, and making like a, a big garden. Uh, so you're bringing plants from another part of the world, and uh, they're they're really mainly for show and not necessarily for function. Uh, so that I think for for iNaturalist sites, they're they're choosing those categories. They're looking at the plant and animal species that normally would be in this region. Uh, and that is what is considered uh, just like a normal observation, and not a cultivated observation. And obviously there are some exceptions like, uh, you know, the, the brown rat, that is on the landscape now. Uh, so they're not going to say it's cultivated or, or it wouldn't count towards a data set because it is, it is now there. Same with like the house bear or, or species like that. Uh, so I just wanted to answer that question. I know a couple people had that uh, recently. Yeah. And as I've been looking at the data set, um, you know, people do document their house plants. Like I could, you know, document my snake plant back here. Um, I'm a naturalist. That's definitely something that I would mark as cultivated, um, you know, as opposed to some, um, you know, restored species at, in a, a small prairie. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know there was one other question. So. Uh, with uh, in terms of, of our project, uh, our project is kind of coming out in, in phases right now. So 
for this initial phase, we're looking at Cook County. Uh, so just beyond kind of the Chicago uh, proper area, I know that was a question. Uh, but the idea is as we're you know, able to gather more information, we're able to see kind of more trends and more patterns in biodiversity, we will be able to then uh, expand to some of the ancillary counties. So maybe including like say Lake or DuPage or, uh, or Will or, or areas like that. But we're kind of thinking of this as, as a very gradual uh, layout. Um, a rollout, and that is really to, to try to build off of tools that we already have, tools that are looking at uh, you know, climate change impacts so that we can incorporate biodiversity information into uh, some of those tools that we already have in place. Uh, but we know that obviously uh, the ecological world does not uh, you know, obey by the man-made boundaries that we all have. So uh, trying to expand it beyond uh, just Cook County, but uh, just starting off with that area and then moving on from there. Yeah, this um, a couple of times it's come up uh, about hosting a bio blitz and iNaturalist is great for this. And there's a lot of projects that people have started surrounding bio blitz. Um, you can create a project that pulls observations of a particular area, or you can even create a project that you want to add particular users to add observations to that area. Um, so it's really great for a bio blitz type thing. And as part of this larger project, we are interested in you know, engaging communities where we don't see as many uh, observations or engagement. And we wanna reach out and get more observations, understand why there aren't as many, maybe there's some barriers that we can overcome or address there. So yeah, we're definitely looking into um, yeah, hosting some events when we're able to and um, yeah, getting, getting more out on the landscape. And, and there are a lot of events that are already going on, the, sh the City Nature Challenge. And then uh, I, can, I can plug this for, for Cassie and a lot of other folks who are, who are organizing this throughout the region. Uh, there are a lot of groups going on that, that are um, uh, you know, hosting this uh, City Nature Challenge, which happens around uh, Earth Day every single year where you know, Chicago, we try to uh, you know, really get those observations up and compete with other cities uh, throughout the world, uh, which is tough being in a, a Northern climate. You know, we, we are, it's, it's an uphill battle sometimes in terms of trying to get all those observations and getting more species than others. But uh, it's, it's a great way to, uh, to really get involved, to get started with this tool and to get connected with other people who are, who are using it. And I, I just want to echo what Nina said. You know, that, that's a great thing about iNaturalist is, you know, what, what we're hoping to, to get information on is getting these uh, plant and animal species observations in areas that people don't normally think to use this tool. So not necessarily in the city parks, but in your own neighborhood. So getting to use it as, as almost a habit and finding those really unexpected sightings is, is what's really helpful and what's really unique about this tool, uh, which is great. Um, we have time for one more question. Oh, okay, this is tough. You know, there's lots of good discussion. I know, and there's there's so many coming in. Uh, if, if we don't answer your question, feel free to reach out to us too uh, through email. Um, we would be happy to, to answer them if, if we've uh, forgotten them. One thing I know that did come up uh, was talking about other data sets. So like talking about Merlin, talking about eBird, uh, Pollard base, there's, there's so many really great uh, data sources out there. The reason we're focused on a naturalist right now is because it is really kind of, uh, it's all included, it's all encompassing. There's no real uh, you know, focus in terms of different taxa. It's, it, you really can identify any living thing uh, that's out there. So we like that idea of, of it not being restricted, but there is also the, the idea that we could incorporate some of these uh, other data sources into future analyses. Uh, that does offer some challenges because, you know, like say eBird, there are tons of observations on eBird, but it's only uh, bird species. So then you have to kind of figure out how you, uh, you know, account for the different uh, weights in terms of uh, representation, having more representation in one group versus another. Um, but that is a good point. And there are a lot of other sources out there, lots of great uh, points of information. But what really drew us to iNaturalist was the fact that you don't have to be an expert in order to use it. And it doesn't, um, you know, focus on any particular taxa.